I'm so excited to belong to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But more important than my excitement of belonging to the church is the recognition that it is an immense privilege for me and for you to be a part of the church. Why is it a great privilege for all of us to be a part of the church? I'm reminded of the very bold words that our Lord Jesus Christ spoke when He was ministering on this earth. The very first time in the New Testament, the word church is used, flowed from the lips of our Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. And it's there our Lord declared with boldness, I will build my church. I want you to note that when he said, I will build my church, amongst many things that can be said about that phrase is the recognition that his church is under construction. He's building it. Now, we know that our Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross. We know that there at the cross, he died as a substitutionary sacrifice for us so that we may be brought near to God. Our Lord Jesus Christ was then buried. And on the third day, bursting forth in glory and power and triumph, he rose again, conquering the grave, conquering death, conquering the devil. And of course, subduing for himself by means of the purchase of redemption, those who'd be his, taking captives in captivity. He then, 40 days later, ascended up to the glory of heaven, was seated as king at the right hand of the Father, and from there sent gifts down to his church. Why? It's so that the church would experience what Jesus said he would do to his church. I will build my church. And the way that the church will be built, the way that we will grow, is through the distribution of gifts which are given for the specific purpose of building up the church. Church growth is not to happen according to man's silly ways. We don't need church growth manuals. They are rubbish. We don't need to survey the community. It's useless. We just need to submit to the marching orders of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has given the church everything she needs to grow, and we can be a part of the excitement of a growing church. Emmanuel Baptist, but not just us, the church around the world. It has been growing, and it is growing, and it will grow, and the fullness of all the elect will be brought in, and there will be people, not every person from every nation, but there will be the redeemed from every tongue, every nation, every tribe, assembled around the throne of God one day, declaring worthy is the Lamb that was slain. We will forever be in the company of the redeemed. And the redeemed will declare the greatness of God and will worship Christ forever. That's why I say I am so excited to be a part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what brings me to the passage that we're looking at this morning. I want to remind you that Ephesians 4, 1 to 16 is about walking in unity Ephesians 4 to 6 is a walking section. And the focus of these 16 verses is all about walking in unity. And as a reminder, we saw in verse 11 that the Lord Jesus Christ has provided gifted leaders to the church. This is one of the ways in which the church is going to attain the unity of the faith. We are unified right now spiritually, spiritually, 
But one day, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ will be unified practically as we will all come to an absolute unity of the content of the faith that we believe and affirm. And the way in which we're going to experience that attaining of the unity of the faith is through the ministry and the gifts of gifted leaders. We see in verse 11 that there is a provision of gifted leaders, and then we'll see in verses 12 to 13 the purpose of gifted leaders. Now, most of our focus this morning is actually on that second one, the purpose of gifted leaders, but you will note that we didn't quite finish off the provision of gifted leaders last week in verse 11. So we need to just deal with the balance of verse 11 before we come to the purpose of these gifted leaders. I noted in verse 11 that the focus is moved away from verse 7. Verse 7 says everyone in the church has been given a gift. But Paul now is focused on some. He's focused on the leaders. And the Lord Jesus Christ has given to the church gifted leaders. And I want you to note that the gifted individuals in verse 11 are spiritual gifts that revolve around the ministry of God's Word. These aren't practical type gifts like the gift of service, the gift of helps, the gift of giving, etc. But these are word-based gifts. And these gifts are given so that the church would attain the unity of the faith. I also had mentioned that of these gifts in verse 11, that it be understood as selective because not every believer receives them. Notice the repetition of the word some. Some are given these gifts. And secondly, these gifts are to be put into two categories. Category number one is that there are some gifts that were given to the church that are extraordinary and temporary. They are not in existence today. And then there are other gifts that the Lord gives to the church that are ordinary and ongoing. And I argued, and I won't go into it again this morning, you can go back to the recording, that the first three offices mentioned in verse 11 are extraordinary and temporary gifts. Apostles, prophets, and evangelists. And to clarify, I don't mean by that that there is an evangelism today. There is, but not the office of evangelist. And this is what brings me to the last one, and that is pastors and teachers. What I want you to notice about the provision of this particular gifted leader is, I think that this is referring to a singular office and not two. The reason for that is you'll notice that each of these gifts is introduced by the word some. Some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and then finally, some pastors and teachers. It doesn't say some pastors and some teachers. So the word some appears to be governing these two terms. And I think it's best to understand pastors and teachers referring to a singular office, the office of pastor-teacher. Now, of course, there are some believers in the church who have the gift of teaching, and they're not necessarily pastors, whilst all pastors must have the gift of teaching. Paul here is referring to the singular office of the pastor-teacher. And what I want you to note firstly about this gift is we put it under the heading that this is a provision of Christ. Christ has provided pastors and teachers to the church. If the ministry of the, the three prior offices was primarily designed to establish the church, and whilst those gifts aren't in operation in the church today, the effects of apostles, prophets, and evangelists are still in operation today, aren't they? Because the gospel is spread. Uh, we have the Word of God. Apostles and prophets had been used by the Lord to be a mouthpiece. So every time we study the Scriptures, every time we read the New Testament, we are devoting ourselves to the teaching of the apostles. So we're still blessed by the apostles and prophets and evangelists. It's just that gift's not in operation. But 
as an ongoing gift, the Lord has very graciously given His church the blessed gift of pastors, teachers. Why are pastor teachers so important to the life of our church? Modern society does not agree, though. Uh, modern society is actually very skeptical and weary of the idea of a pastor teacher. In a 2019 survey that I remember reading back in the Australian a number of years ago, an interesting survey took place concerning those in Australian society that the public trust the most. But they also asked the question, who are those in society that you trust the least? Very fascinating. I'd love to see perhaps a comparison of the same questions, but a hundred years earlier. Because a lot has shifted in our society and particularly in our Australian culture. You may not be surprised to hear that when the survey was conducted, uh, the results came through saying that when it comes to those that people believe are to be most trustworthy, 62% uh, of those who voted said that the most trustworthy profession is a doctor. Now, this was followed by uh, scientists that may have changed in recent years. The teachers were up there, the armed forces, and police. There was a consensus that when it comes to these positions in society that, generally speaking, uh, people would view them as individuals that we can trust. And perhaps you could introduce yourself as saying, trust me, I'm a doctor, and we might be okay. But when asked, well, what were the occupations that you don't trust? What are the ones that you have to stay away with? Uh, ranking number one of all who voted, 64% said without hesitation, politicians. We don't trust them. And this was followed by advertising executives, bankers. But 42% said we don't trust the clergy. We don't trust ministers, pastors. Why? That wasn't on the, qu the survey. But I certainly think about what goes on in the culture at the time when that survey was conducted, and there were many scandals amongst pastors, priests, and others who claim to be servants of the Lord. Of course, society throws them all in one big basket, but it's interesting that people may believe various things and may be influenced by various things, but I think the bottom line as to why most people don't believe a, a pastor is trustworthy is because many pastors are conducting themselves in such a way that they're not fulfilling the biblical requirements of their ministry. They are giving themselves reasons to be not trusted. If pastors, anyone who claims to be a minister of the Lord in the church, was committed to the biblical qualifications and took that seriously and would commit themselves to a ministry that is focused on what Jesus Christ wants for His church and nothing else, I think we'd have a very different understanding. But today, when you ask a lot of people, who do you look for in a pastor, you'll hear all sorts of responses, won't you? pastor will really would like to have someone who's a very good entertainer, someone who gives us some laughs. Uh, perhaps the pastor is to sort of be viewed as my life coach. I've got a fitness coach on the side. I've, I've got various people I listen to on podcasts who help me at work. And then I, I need someone just to spill, fill that spiritual void in my life. I need this sort of spiritual coach who, who doesn't tell me too much, but but just tells me enough to, to get me through week by week. Uh, perhaps a pastor in someone's mind is uh, the person who just simply does everything at a church and will just sit and listen to them and, and uh, be encouraged and go on our merry way. 
Uh, perhaps the pastor has to look a particular way. He's probably too big to fit in his T-shirt sometimes, and he has to let the congregation know about it. Maybe he's got a large following on social media. He's written a certain, certain amount of books. Maybe he doesn't even need to be a he. What is it that makes a pastor what the Scripture teaches? Well, let's be clear on one thing. Ephesians 4 and verse 11 says that Christ has gifted the church with pastors and teachers. Pastors and teachers is not a modern invention. It is a gift of the Lord Jesus Christ for His church for the purpose of the church to attain the unity of the faith. And therefore, it is most offensive when any self-styled pastor would have a ministry, anything other than what the Lord Jesus Christ requires of His shepherds. A pastor is to be an under-shepherd of Jesus Christ. He's to be in submission to Him. He is to function as someone who will tend and care for the flock that has been entrusted to Him. He is to feed the lambs. He is to feed the sheep. He is to love them and care for them. He is to serve them. What is a pastor teacher? Well, let's quickly break up these terms. First of all, there's this word pastor. It really is the word for shepherd. This means that he's to protect the flock. He's to lead the flock. He's to feed the flock. The idea behind this word pastor is one of leadership. He is on the lookout for anything that will harm the sheep, and he will go after it and protect his sheep. But he'll also see to it that his sheep are being led to those green pastures where they will thrive and be fed. He won't ask the sheep what they want to be fed, because when we get to choose what we want, we don't always choose the best things, do we? Just think about your own diet at home. You're a little child, and mum and dad say, look, the policy of this family is that we're going to give you everything you want. Now, that will be interesting. It might be a little exciting at first, but you're going to have all sorts of issues going on. You're going to have all sorts of health issues. Eventually, you're going to have stunted growth. You're going to have all sorts of things go on. And Paul says to Timothy, when you preach the Word, there's going to be a time when congregations will heap up for themselves teachers that will tickle their ears. They'll want teachers who teach them what they want. And Paul says, don't do that. But instead, a, a pastor is to be a shepherd who feeds the sheep what they need, and that is the Word of God. Now, they are to feed the sheep. A pastor teacher is a shepherd but in addition to shepherding the congregation and showing that care towards the people, loving the people, praying for the people, ministering to the people, serving the people, they are to be teachers. And this means that they are to take the body of truth as revealed in the Word of God, the words that flowed out of the apostles and the prophets, and they are to teach that to the people. They are to instruct the people with what the Word of God says. They are to make plain what the Word of God says. This, of course, implies that the pastor teachers are to be gifted. They are to have a recognized endowment from the Lord in which they have the capacity to be able to study, to be able to comprehend, and to be able to communicate clearly. They are to be teaching the Word of God. They are to labor in this task. They are, according to 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, to be diligent, to show themselves approved as a workman not needing to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. They are to work hard. They're not to enter into pulpits and say, let me tell you my opinions today. They're not to read the newspaper and say, let me give you a commentary. They're not to be people who are constantly overreacting to what is or isn't going on in a culture. They are to do what the historic pastor teachers have always done, and that is regardless of the time and the age they're in, they are to take the Word of God, they are to study it, they are to understand it in its context, and they are to rightly proclaim what the Lord God had revealed in the text of Scripture. Scripture. 
whether it is acceptable or not acceptable in the culture, whether it's what the people want or don't want, they are to proclaim the Word of God with faithfulness. It ought to be done plainly, it ought to be done precisely, and it ought to be done passionately. They are not there to impress you, but they are there to come with a burden And the burden is, this is what the word of the Lord says. That is what they are to be most interested in. And I want you to know that that is our Lord's idea. This is not a modern thing that came as a result of the Protestant Reformation. The Reformers may have restored this way of thinking, but that's exactly what they were doing, restoring it. It's a historical truth. It's what Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2 that you are to preach the Word, and you are to be instant in season and out of season. You are to exhort, reprove, and rebuke, and you're to do it with all patience. You are to take God's Word and proclaim it to the people, because this is the way in which the church will grow. Jesus has made it this way. And that is why it is absolutely sad and horrible when you see that preaching is replaced by entertainment, that the teaching of God's Word is removed or perhaps relegated to a very small portion of the service. I read a report from Martin Lloyd-Jones this morning where he said, a report was given to him on good authority, and you need to understand that the doctor was not one prone to exaggeration. If he heard a report based on good authority, it's a very accurate one, no doubt. And he said that he heard of a certain church that meets in certain seasons with some very wealthy individuals who would attend. But these individuals demanded that when they would attend this church, when they would attend, that the minister was to speak no longer than seven minutes. This is absolutely ridiculous. Now, I don't believe that preachers should be long-winded. I don't think it's spiritual to go as long as you can. But the preacher ought to proclaim faithfully the Word of God. And let me just say, if we've got the time to watch a documentary or a movie, we've got time for a solid hour around God's Word. Oh, but people have short attention spans. Well, realign your thinking because you need to be fed the Word of God. As long as the preacher is preaching the Word of God and isn't full of hot air, because I don't want to listen to someone full of hot air, as long as they're not there just giving their opinions... As long as they're not a cultural commentator, if they are faithfully proclaiming God's Word, we ought to recognize that this is the diet we need. And a faithful pastor teacher will be someone who will expose the congregation not to cherry-picked portions of God's Word, not their favorite topics, but a faithful preacher will be committed to proclaiming the whole counsel of God. You remember the Apostle Paul when he visited the city of Ephesus? He spent two years there. And we're told in Acts 20 and verse 20 that he went from house to house and taught in public every single day. But there in um, Acts 20 and verse 17, the Apostle Paul, as he was saying farewell to the weeping Ephesian elders who didn't want him to go, Paul said that for these last two years, I did not shrink back from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. I taught you the things that were easy to understand, and I explained to you the things that were hard. I gave you the things that were easy to listen to and that were exciting to listen to, but I gave you the things that we want to avoid and are convicting. I gave it all. I taught all of Scripture to you. And that's what a faithful pastor teacher does. They just simply want to give you what the next verse says, what the next phrase says, because they're convinced that every word, every letter of the Word of God has been given by inspiration to the Holy Spirit, and we need it all. There are certain meals, I have to confess, I'll scrape certain items off if no one's looking, because I don't like it. It doesn't taste nice, but I know it's good for me. And we don't want to be in a position where in the church that your pastors approach the ministry of the Word of God in that way, that we'll just serve you what you think you need or what we think you need, but we need to be faithful to giving you everything you need. Well, I'm going to stop at that particular point
as we bring that first point to a close, which we really meant to do last week, and that is Christ has provided gifted teachers to the church. And those gifted teachers are seen in the blessed word ministries of apostles, prophets, evangelists, and in an ongoing and ordinary way, He has given the church pastors and teachers. These pastors and teachers are a part of an eldership given the responsibility of leading and shepherding a congregation. Secondly, we see in this passage that in order for the church to attain to the unity of the faith, we need to understand the purpose of these gifted leaders. Why has Jesus given these gifted leaders to the church? Why is it that a church should have an eldership that oversees them? And when we see the position of a pastor-teacher, there is a a legitimate sense in which all the elders are pastor-teachers, but we tend to understand from other portions of the New Testament that there will tend to be uh, one amongst the elders who is equal amongst them, but is given the responsibility to lead and will be the primary um, pastor-teacher in the church. Why has Christ given this to the church? The answer is found in verses 12 to 13, and that is the purpose of gifted leaders. And what I want you to notice from verses 12 to 13 is two things. Gifted leaders have been given to the church for an immediate purpose and then for an ultimate purpose. The immediate purpose is found in verse 12, and the ultimate purpose is found in verse 13. What's the immediate purpose of the gifted leaders in verse 11? What is the immediate purpose for God giving them to the church? I want you to see the answer in verse 12, but before we look at verse 12 closely, I want to make an observation that seems to divide commentators, but in my view, doesn't have to be as controversial as some make it. And that is, how do you read verse 12? If you have a New King James, a New American Standard, Legacy Standard Bible, an English Standard Version, and I think we can add nearly every other contemporary translation, you will notice that the grammar of this verse is presented in such a way that we see that the purpose of these gifted leaders is that they equip the saints for the work of the ministry, comma, and they are given for the edifying of the body. So, most English translations give the idea that the gifted leaders have two immediate purposes. It's to equip you so that you do the work of the ministry, and secondly, it's so that you be built up. Now, that's true. That's absolutely true. But the second view, and it's the view that comes from the King James Version, the Geneva Bible, and some other Old English translations, and that is you need to put a comma after the word saints. So, in other words, the purpose of the gifted leaders isn't two things. It's, number one, they are to equip the saints. Number two, do the work of the ministry. And number three, edify the body of Christ. That's also true, and you can argue both of these views from Scripture. So, these views aren't contradictions. They can be argued in different places. The question is not which one is actually right biblically. Both are, but the question is, what is Paul meaning here? And some people will say, well, you just go back to the original Greek and see where the comma is. But did you know there's actually no commas in the original Greek? Uh, There are some Greek New Testaments that insert a comma, which is actually rather unhelpful because that's not in the original. So, there's actually no comma there. But what we do have is an interesting formula in in the Greek. It's somewhat reflected in our English translations by the repetition of the word for, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Um, In the Greek, there's uh, one word used for equipping, And then the word for work of the ministry and the edifying is the same. But there there clearly is three um, articles in there that divide these three. But the ultimate determiner of all of this 
is what's the context? That's the best way to determine this. And I want to show you why this is important. The context is verse 11. What's the focus of verse 11? Christ has given what? He's given leaders. And it's not until verse 13 that Paul talks about the congregation as a we. But he's still talking about what the leaders do in verse 13. And he's still talking about what the leaders do in verse 14 down to verse 16. I think in passages like Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, the focus is on the body of Christ doing the ministry, serving one another, using our spiritual gifts for one another. But the context here, even though Paul begins in verse 7 by talking about all of us having gifts, grammatically, Paul's subject in verse 11 down to verse 16 is on what the leaders are doing for the church. So even though there are people I desperately love and respect and will have a different view to me on this, I don't agree with them. And my argument here is there ought to be a comma after the word saints. So I think it should read that he's given these gifted leaders, verse 11, for three immediate purposes, so that the gifted leaders would equip the saints, the gifted leaders would do the work of the ministry, and the gifted leaders would edify the body of Christ. Now, some people jump in there and say, well, you're creating a division between the clergy and the laity. No, I'm not. You just said that. And let me explain. And I think this explanation will actually show that those two opposing views are actually friends at the end of the day. Number one, God gives the church gifted leaders so that they would equip the saints. This word equip is a beautiful word. The word equip means to mend something. In classical Greek, it was actually used in the medical world. If you had a dislocated bone, if there was a break in your bones, the medical doctor had the responsibility to mend your bones so that he could put you back into good shape. He could help adjust your body physically so that you would then be able to heal and then be strong and function and run and jump and do all sorts of things. The word was also used in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 4, and it was used of James and John when they were mending their nets. Their nets were all twisted up. Uh, they, They needed to be loosened up and adjusted so that when they cast the nets into the water, they are able to effectively catch fish. And the same word that could be used to adjust someone physically so that their body would be healthy and would function, the same word that would be used of mending a broken net or a twisted net, Paul takes that and says, God gives gifted leaders to the church so that the flock would be mended. You see, we all come broken and we need to be strengthened and built up and adjusted. And how do we do that? We do that by being exposed to the Word of God. The leadership of the church has the responsibility to see to it that you are being adjusted spiritually, that you're being built up and mended, that you're being prepared and equipped so that you may live a life that is honoring and pleasing to Christ. And that's going to come through their preaching and teaching ministry. It's going to come through their prayers for you. It's going to come through disciple relationships, discipleship relationships. It's going to come through all sorts of forms. But this is the immediate purpose of gifted leaders to a church. Churches are to have the saints, all of the saints, all of the members are to be in the process of being equipped equipped in the Word of God. That means you ought to come to the church with the eager expectation of saying, how am I going to be spiritually adjusted today? What mending is going to happen for me as I eagerly sit under the Word of God? As the Word of God is broken open and and announced to me, what needs to be adjusted in my life? I need to be equipped. I need to grow. I need to serve the Lord more. Are you coming with that heart? Because the responsibility on you is to come eagerly. Don't be the patient on the table who's broken their bone. The doctor's trying to fix it, and they're just kicking around everywhere. 
you need to lay still. You need to work with me here. Jump ahead in 2019 in Australia, over 60% of the Australians think I'm a trustworthy person. <laughs> but you've got to trust me. And so it is with us, we come with an eager expectation to submit under the preaching of the Word of God so that we may be adjusted spiritually. Secondly, and I take this as a second purpose of the gifted teachers, gifted leaders ministry, is that they are to do the work of the ministry. Now, what that doesn't mean is that the gifted leaders do all the work of the ministry. That's not true because the Bible talks about the congregation fulfilling the one another's. It talks about us using our spiritual gifts, ministering to one another. Nor is this saying that the pastors of the church are to be micromanagers. Uh, let me give you a ministry responsibility, but then let me take that off you and I'll do it better. Or let me shadow you and hover over you and make you feel uncomfortable so then in the end you actually don't end up doing it effectively. That's not what this is saying either. What does it then mean if it says that God has gifted the church with these leaders so that they would do the work of the ministry? I think the work of the ministry is parallel to what comes before and after, and that is they are to simply be given to the work of building up the church and training them in the Word of God so that they may be built up and ultimately would do the work of the ministry themselves. But it is actually the task of the leaders of the church to do the work of the ministry in the official sense. I think this is what Paul is saying to Timothy when he says, fulfill your ministry. In 2 Timothy 4, 5, to fulfill his ministry is to carry out the task of official service as a minister of the Lord to preach the word and to love the people. It's the same thing that we read of in 2 Corinthians 4, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, where we learn that this is a stewardship. They are made ministers of the new covenant, ministers of the gospel. So what Paul is saying here is that the immediate purpose of the gifted leaders in the church is that they would do the work of ministry. And their ministry is to be feeding the church, to be shepherding the church, to be overseeing the church, to be protecting the church. Thirdly, the immediate purpose of these gifted leaders is that they would edify the body of Christ. The word edify means to build up the body. In other words, the purpose of your pastors is to have a, building, a bodybuilding ministry. Now, you might look at us and think, yeah, whatever, <laughs> you guys don't, don't look like you have a bodybuilding ministry. But no, we have a bodybuilding ministry, and the bodybuilding ministry is you. So how are you doing then? Are you looking like someone who has a built-up body? Well, we're talking about a spiritual body here. Have you got spiritual muscles? Are you growing? Are you strong in the Lord? Are you loving Christ more now than you did yesterday? Are you fighting against sin? Are you fighting for joy? Are you seeking to advance the gospel? Are you seeking to be a blessing to those around you? Are you seeking to meet the needs of those around you? Are you seeking to get to know people better? Are you seeking to pray for one another more? Are you seeking to love one another more? Are you seeking to rejoice with one another more? Are you seeking to biblically confront one another more? Are you seeking to do everything you can so that we would be strong? Well, it's the gifted leaders' responsibility to be doing all they can so that you are being built up, so that you will then continue to build others up around you. This is how Jesus has made the church. So he has provided the church with gifted leaders to fulfill the immediate purpose of equipping the saints, doing the work of ministry, and edifying the body of Christ. Now we come to the final part of the purpose of the gifted leaders, and that is their ultimate purpose. What is the ultimate purpose of all of this? Why has Jesus done it? He's done it so that immediately the church would be growing, the church would be built up, the church would be strong, but ultimately it's so that something happens in the future for His church. Look at the introductory phrase, till we all come. There is a ultimate purpose here. And what 
the rest of verse 13 describes is something that will happen in the future. And by the way, this is not talking about you individually, this is talking about us as a whole. Christ has given the church gifted leaders so that you would be edified with the ultimate purpose of verse 13. And while you're looking at verse 13, notice a term that's repeated. It's the word to. Three times. So that means there's three parts to this ultimate goal. And that is that you would come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Number two, to a perfect man. And three, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What are these three parts of the ultimate purpose talking about? Well, the first one, the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, is referring to the way that we are eventually going to come to a unity with all believers concerning the content of the Christian faith. We know that we don't all have the same knowledge. We don't all have the same areas of agreement. People will think different things on secondary matters. We'll have some necessary divisions and sadly unnecessary divisions. But the time is coming in which God has gifted the church with these leaders so that the people would be trained so that eventually the church will grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ and we collectively will attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. And the way that we do that is by keeping the knowledge of the Son of God before us. If we ever want to experience more and more unity as a church, well, we have a very simple commitment, and that commitment is to keep the knowledge of Christ before us. If He's the head of the church, then we will be unified if we keep our eyes on the head, keep our eyes on Him, keep our focus on Him. You see, disunity arises when we keep our eyes on ourselves, or when we keep our eyes on each other. I'm trying to find something you're going to do wrong. But if we keep our eyes on Christ, then anything that doesn't match Christ ought to be confronted in me and ought to be confronted in you, so that together we may be strengthened and honor Christ. That's the ultimate purpose of God giving leaders to the church, is that the church would attain one day the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Secondly, that the church would become a perfect man. Now, that means a, a fully grown man, a, a mature person. Well, right now, we're growing we're developing. Uh, we're going through all sorts of things. We've got strengths, we've got weaknesses, but the time will come in which the church will be presented to Jesus as a complete man. Wow. Mature, fully grown, developed, and that's what we are to be striving for. That is what our goal is. When I sit under the Word of God, I want to hear it so that I may grow up. That's what Paul's saying. And thirdly and finally, the ultimate purpose of Christ giving gifted teachers to the church is that we would come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You can see these all relate to each other. It's that we grow in Christ's likeness. If we are keeping the knowledge of Christ before us, the ultimate goal is that we would be like Him. He's the one who issues the gifts, and He's the one who performs all the spiritual gifts perfectly. So if we're going to faithfully carry out spiritual gifts, we don't need surveys. We don't need our own opinions. We just simply need to keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and walk in His steps. And when we do that, we are growing, we are maturing, and the beautiful thing is the day will come when this will actually be true of the church. And what a day that will be. We could say that as a body, the day is coming when we will all grow up. We will all be mature. You know what it's like when you're younger, you're longing to, to grow up. You, you want to be able to do things. You want to be able to accomplish things. You're just longing to get older. Of course, we get older and then we wish we were younger. But in the church, it won't be like that. The sad thing is we're content with being young. We're content with being immature. We're content with not having good teaching or we're content with 
simply being complacent. We get content with things like that, and it's not good. But what we ought to be wanting and longing for as a church is that we would grow and become more like Christ. And here's the good news. When we do finally grow up, we will not want to go back. And for all eternity, we will enjoy the spiritual maturity that Christ has built us to be. What a day that will be. Well, Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 13 teach us that the ascended, conquering, victorious Christ, who reigns as king, has provided his church with gifted leaders. And he's done this with the purpose that these gifted leaders would be used as a means that would help the people of God to grow in the grace and knowledge of God so that they will eventually attain to the unity of the faith and be made like Christ. Every time you participate in any church ministry here at EBC, be it a small group, a church service, our greeting ministry, our morning tea, our fellowship, our children's ministry, our Sunday school, our teaching of Scripture, any other form of evangelism, or simply what you do in your home, know and understand that as you keep your eyes on Christ, you are a part of something big. Jesus is building his church, and the way his church grows is when the people of God are being built up so that they are released to serve with all their might. And when we do that, we are going to bring glory to God, and we are ready to be dispatched to advance the gospel in ways that will be effective and bring glory to God. Isn't it exciting? to be a part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ.